It's July, about 8.30 in the evening. It's nighttime, of course, and this was our final night in Key West. Steve and I sat in the second floor of one of the finest lobster and steak houses in town. This final night in town was supposed to be our rap celebration. We had spent the week in Key West shooting a motivational documentary. However, we hadn't succeeded. We hadn't completed the shoot but failed. So let me back up one week and give you some detail on what happened. This is the Life's Learning Curve Podcast. I'm Paul Hart. Stand by for part one of Tropical Turpitude. I've done documentary work probably for five or six different people where I've done research or I've done editing, camera work in the field contact responsibilities and things. So I wanted to do my own one-of-a-kind documentary. I wanted it to be true, real, something with self-awareness in it, something of that caliber. So I spent a year, probably two years, thinking about it. I probably wanted to sell it, or I wanted it to be something I could make a series from. I needed a subject, and I needed some content, and boy, did I find a good person to help me out here. It was my friend Greg from Key West. Smart as a whip, talented, he had life experiences that went in every direction. In his brain, it was like cloud storage. It was everywhere. He had so much to say, and he could say it in such a short, brief, concise period of time. I thought Key West was a perfect setting. It's a small island that's in the last of the Florida Keys. The highway ends there. It's called Highway A1A, and it just stops. You're at the end of the United States. And if you don't believe that, there's quite a few kiosks and small shops and places to sell you mouse pads, t-shirts, postcards, even toll rings that prove you're in the southernmost point of the United States. Now, Key West is inundated every year by three to four million tourists. However, on its own, Key West is a really quiet, small port town with enough colorful characters to probably fill every fiction book published in the next year. From the insanely rich to the street people. I wanted it to be a secondary character in the documentary. So let's jump ahead. We'll cut ahead to about two to three months later. It's July, about 8.30 in the evening. It's nighttime, of course, and this was our final night in Key West. Steve and I sat in the second floor of one of the finest lobster and steak houses in town. To our left, we enjoyed a gentle breeze, open air windows. We could hear the palm trees whispering in the wind. Very calming, very relaxing. And the view, wow. You could see the sun sizzling into the Gulf of Mexico. Palm trees were swaying gently in the gentle breeze. It was just marvelous. It was great. To my right, about 30 to 40 very well-dressed patrons. I'll have the lobster. And they were having their dinners, enjoying the day's fresh catch, and quietly chatting with one another. Now, this final night in town was supposed to be our production's rap celebration. We had spent the entire week in Key West shooting a motivational documentary. However, we had not succeeded. We had not completed the shoot, but we failed. So let me back up a week and fill you in on what happened. First, who's Steve? Tall skinny guy. Well, Steve was a friend from back in my college days. He was thin. He was about six feet tall. He was a couple years older than me, which put him in about his mid-50s at the time. How you doing? He was happy. He was a positive guy, respectful, smart, and Good to see you. in general, just a great guy to have around at all occasions. Okay. <laughs> he came to town to try and put his life back together. He had been a respected muckety-muck at a large corporation in the Midwest, and Over 23 years, he had worked there. And after a reduction in personnel and one bad business decision, Steve was jobless. After 23 years in the same company, 
He was like all the other desperate men in Key West who try to hook that elusive sailfish in the Keys just one more time before they die. I can do it. He was unable to find work. Yeah. Age has a way of keeping the most experienced muckety-mucks from landing on their feet in the job market. Leave it to me. Now, here's Steve Sat with me in Key West as my production assistant and future marketing and sales director. I can do it. But somewhere deep down in Steve's psyche, he was fighting his own personal demons. Deep down, unknown to me, unknown to probably everybody, Steve had a drinking problem. Now my investment in this project was 100%. It was just me. It was me funding cameras, crew, meals, lodging, expenses, gasoline, output, everything. So it was imperative that we complete this shoot in Key West on time and within the budget. I knew it was a realistic goal because I had built in days. Just in case we'd made mistakes, there would be time to reshoot. It was just a week earlier we had made that trek from the summer warmth of the mid Midwest to the tropical breezes and freedom of the Keys to shoot this documentary. I had already checked into a mid-level, comfortable hotel on Duval Street right in the hub of the middle of the town. I had been scouting locations, getting permits ready, and trying to get some pre-excitement going in town about our documentary. So Steve motored into Key West, radio blaring in his convertible. I noticed the inside of his convertible had maybe 30 to 40 empty bottles of local cheap beer in both the front and the back seats. Empties. He was proud to show me that he'd already stopped by to get another case of 24 bottles at the local liquor store, which he promptly loaded to chill in our room's mini fridge. I thought that was kind of odd, but I had not yet concluded that Steve had some behavior issues with alcohol. My production assistant is in town and we are ready to go. We'll hit the ground running tomorrow. But first, late that afternoon, Steve and I walked to grab a bite to eat. The sun lit up the sides of the building in town as if they were being lit to show me the beauty of that small town from a different and more contrasted perspective. As an editor and a color grader of film and video, the intensity of these colors really appealed to me, but I didn't say anything. Steve and I walked through the Old Town section of Key West. He had brought a beer with him from the room and drank it openly out in the sidewalk in public, which is, well, it's, it's, a, it's a big no-no in town. And we had a conversation, and I said, Steve, keep your beer, keep it out of the sight. Don't let anybody see it. Why? Oh, I'll get you a beer at the restaurant. And this one. And with that, suddenly Steve tripped, and he fell to the ground hard. His knee was bloody. And he was angry, but he was angry that he dropped his beer. But not concerned about his bloodied knee. Oh, his man. mood at that point became oh. dark. He slowly got up. I realized that Steve was somewhat drunk already. It was the first time I realized it. And he looked at me as he got up and he growled. I hope you're a real man's man. Are you a real man? What do you mean? What happens here stays here. I have a wife back home, you know. You know, Sarah. Keep that in mind. Steve, we're here to work. Well, I'm not. I'm here in Key West, and I'm going to have fun while I'm here. Steve, before we left, I hired you because you said you could work in this environment. There was no response from him for a while. But then he said, uh, Besides moving equipment, what will I do? I told him, we talked about this back in Illinois, back in the Midwest. We both will move equipment. I need you to get release forms. I need you to help me find willing people to be interviewed. Help keep us both on track and help me keep the project on schedule. 
He looked at me and he said, And that's grunt work. I want to be the person that does the in-charge stuff, the director, or who do you call the person in charge? Now that was an odd comment coming from Steve. He had no background in media. He was strictly business. But I was kind of proud at the moment that he wanted to learn about it. But no, no, no. no. suddenly I was totally overcome. I knew this was not the Steve that I knew. He was generally happy, friendly, helpful. Who's this guy? I flashed back to some of my experiences I had back in college as I sat at the table. I had to babysit acquaintances at college that had come into town to see their friends and they drunk too much alcohol. Suddenly I wished I had paid better attention in psychology class. But I stayed on topic. Either I was right or I was wrong and I still don't know to this day, but I told him that, I said, Steve, after each take, after each segment, we can confer we're going to get together and we'll talk real briefly about was it a good take, should we do it again, or was it great and we can move on. We're in the tropics, we're going to do the best that we can. Yeah. Around 7.30 p.m., a bloodied need Steve and I arrived at a small casual restaurant and we took a table outside and settled in. I'll have a beer. Pop and rock music came from all the speakers. It was 70s music. It was in the patio area where we sat. You could smell the sizzling burgers being grilled nearby. I did not feel like drinking a beer or anything else alcoholic. I had water, I had pop of some sort. I saw what the beer was doing to Steve and it made me uneasy. Bring us a couple beers. I felt this anxiety growing from Steve's anger and defiance. What would he do next? I was trying to concentrate on the work we were doing in town, but I had this distraction. Steve was in trouble in paradise and the beer was just making things worse. Next, the waitress came to our table and Steve uttered one of two phrases he would use over and over the entire week on a broad range of women and girls. Can I just say, uh, you have the most beautiful face I think I've ever seen. I bet you get told that all the time, do you? Our waitress summed up Steve's overconsumption issue immediately and said, Thank you. And walked off. When she returned with our food, Steve jumped up. Steve grabbed her by the arm. And I found myself saying, Steve, come on, let her go. The waitress sighed, somewhat disappointed. And she told me it was okay and that she dealt with this type of thing too often in this town. Steve still stood there. He had his back to me. As she brushed his hand off her arm, it happened. I heard a loud and staccato flatulence caused by all that beer from Steve. Not only had she heard, my face was in direct contact with the emissions. Not missing a beat, Steve picked up a piece of asphalt from the ground and said, Oh, (laughs) I'll have another beer, please. And one for the road here. Soon the owner came over, and I kind of expected this. He asked us both to leave. Get out. I apologized. Get out. Steve exited, grumbling. I went, Mm. and I paid the bill, and I left. Only when I reached the sidewalk, I found Steve was already in another situation. I walked outside. What I saw was Steve pulling on some 20-something young woman. He had grabbed her by the arm and held her tightly. Can I just say, you have the most beautiful face I've, I've ever seen. You must get told that all the time, do you? Now this young lady was with her family. She was with her mom and she was with her dad and they became quite angry with Steve's behavior. I apologized for him and then physically grabbed him by both shoulders and yanked him away from the sidewalk into a nearby alley. Steve was a thin man about six feet tall, easy to move. 
but in his condition, he felt invincible. Is that all you got? Plus, all these encounters he felt weren't his fault. I'm sorry to say this on the podcast, but he said they were asking for it. No good. Nope. Bad. Steve looked at me, eyes became small, beady, and angry, and said, What are you doing? I said, listen, Steve, you need to go back to the room and sleep this off. You sleep this off. Forget you. Except Steve didn't use the word forget. And Steve disappeared into the night and did not return until around 11 p.m. that evening. Three hours later, two men escorted Steve back to our hotel room. He had been kicked out of a local Irish bar. No, he could not the escorts told no, me that no. Steve wasn't to, to come, come back to their bar the again, again, ever again. No, the way. No. Ignorant and optimistic, I was. I summed up Steve's behavior to first day in paradise, fun gone out of control excessiveness. He'd be back to his old self tomorrow, the next day. That night was a blur to me. Stand by, we'll be back right after this. Well, hello. You are invited to tune in to my podcast, Just Billing It, the podcast that will bring you listening laughter, well intentioned opinions, and true stories along the way. We present an array of circumstances and subject matter surrounding the awesomely awesome people over the age of 40, 50, 60, and beyond. Those of you in your 20s and 30s, stick around and take notes for the future. My name is Suzanne, and I am your host. Please join in wherever you get your podcast. I look forward to seeing you on Just Spilling It's Facebook page. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. We are everywhere you need us to be. Cheers. Welcome back to Life's Learning Curve. Tropical turpitude continues. The following morning, among sunny skies, light breezes, and curious cruise ship tourists, Steve seemed to remember none of his behaviors from last night, his first night in town. Sleepily, we both stumbled into the courtyard of the hotel, and there was a breakfast buffet. And we enjoyed a light breakfast, and Steve was his old self, and he was full of good humor and friendly and asked Mm -hmm. nice questions. I relaxed a lot. But soon, the conversation shifted. And little did I know that these would be Steve's morals and ethics for that entire week in Key West. Steve said to me, (laughs) Paul, remember what I said. What happens here stays here. I have a wife back at home, you know that. You know Sarah. Keep that in mind. Don't be the person that destroys my marriage. (laughs) She doesn't need to know any of this, and this is just what real men do when real men are out on the road. Real men? What? Be a man's man. Come on. Steve, we are here working. If we have any spare time, We'll look around town, we'll have dinner, we'll have lunch. The schedule's tight this week. Money's tight. We need to keep our focus even in the off hours. I shrugged off the man's man comment and left to begin to load equipment into the car. We had one of our main primary shoots that day. While inside the room, I found the kitchen full of empties. I grabbed as many bottles as I could and I threw them into the trash recycle. And on the kitchenette counter, I saw that one of us had actually left out some milk from cereal. I opened the mini fridge and I immediately saw that there were only four bottles of beer left. During the night, Steve had drunk at least 20 bottles of beer from the mini fridge. Now I have no background in managing situations like this. I'd come from the world of education and commercial video shoots where people were there because they wanted to work or they wanted to learn. Primary shoot number one. It was a beautiful day in paradise and Steve and I 
headed over to Fabiana's house. This was a woman who had heard about our project and generously offered her bountiful flowered, color-filled backyard, pool area, amazing tropical plants for the setting of segment one out of the three segments we were going to shoot with our main character, Greg. Oh, welcome. Hello. And we arrived and began unloading equipment, cameras, lights, audio, reflectors for the bright sun. (laughs) After bringing the camera case to the backyard, Steve went missing. The heat was stagnant, the air was humid, and it was very intense when you were away from the shoreline. And we were in the center of the island. Now I'm a one-man crew. We found the location for our talent, Greg. It was in a chair, it would be in the shade, and we would use one reflector as a way to bounce softer sunlight. I still couldn't find Steve, but we were on the clock and I had no time to hunt him down. Our talent, Greg, arrived on time, prepared, in a great mood, optimistic. I was thrilled when something went right that day. (laughs) And as a last set decoration for segment number one, I added a bright red tropical drink with an umbrella on a nearby glass table and a basket full of fresh lemons and limes. Even though it looked nice and cool and tropical, sweat poured down my face and Fabiana gave me a cool bottle of water and a towel. The environment I visually wanted was one of comfort, calm, tropical beauty. Both of the cameras were in the hot sun and I white balanced the cameras, I measured the focus, I assembled and I found the proper frequency for the wireless microphones we would use all week. I did need Steve though during the shoot to literally block the super hot reflective sun that would occasionally burst through the trees. I had a big piece of cardboard with us and we were going to use that, but there was no Steve in sight. Now I was still able to begin even on time despite my missing production assistant. I had to ask Fabiana, the owner of the house, to hold the light reflector and thank goodness she was, she was thrilled to do this. Greg was such a good interview we shot through the segment in about an hour, hour and a half. I was really pleased with what we shot that day. Fabiana had now made her way into the credits as well. As we were shooting the last words of segment one for the day, Steve appeared in the backyard holding a beer. He had found a neighborhood bar and he slurred his words and was obviously intoxicated. And I said, Steve, You need to stay here while we're shooting. I need you to help me. You said I could direct this. You know it's your fault. This is your thing. I don't care about your thing or you. Now I have to tell you, I was embarrassed. Not humiliated that it hadn't gotten there yet. I came into town as this professional in media and my production assistant was with me. And there he was, drunkenly dressing me down. And this was not the place to have this conversation. As Greg and Fabiana looked on, they saw Steve set his beer down on the glass table. As he stumbled a step, he knocked the entire glass table into Fabiana's oval, crystal clear swimming pool. The glass top didn't break, thankfully, but I watched as it quickly got sucked to the bottom of the main drain where suction held it tightly to the bottom. I felt terrible and I found myself diving into the water, but I could not unsuction the glass tabletop from the drain. Getting out of the pool looking somewhat like a drowned rat, I told Fabiana that I would pay for any damage or pool service necessary. But she was very understanding and she was a very kind woman and she told me, You would be better off to ditch that production assistant of yours. He is a drinker. Do not worry about it. About the filter, I will turn it off and it should release the glass table top from the main deep drain area. Now I had to admit to Fabiana that I had no idea about Steve's drinking behaviors before we arrived here. I shook her hand with great gratitude and I thanked Greg for the work he'd done that day. He grinned at me. He had to go back to work. 
I watched Steve chain smoke as I loaded every piece of equipment. A lot of gear back into the car, front seat and back seat. Pretty heavy, huh? During that time, I even heard Steve tell Fabiano, You know, can I tell you something? You have the most beautiful face I think I've ever seen. Stop it. Grow up. I bet you get told that all the time, do you? As I started the car, Steve was still out smoking a cigarette. I heard Steve yell, Let's work by another swimming pool. What a great idea, Paul. Great. And with that, I found myself putting the car into drive and accelerating back down the block. I did not look back. I heard Steve yelling. And the words he was using weren't neighborhood acceptable or neighborhood friendly. So at the end of the block, I did stop at the stop sign. And I didn't want to wait long as Steve caught up and breathlessly got into the passenger seat of the car. Now, I have a very long fuse when it comes to anger. However, I was angry with Steve at this time. And he uttered, <laughs> Forget something? <laughs> Steve was surprised by my passive aggressive behavior. I said nothing about what he had done, and he knew what he had done. It was a totally silent ride back to the hotel. Now way out of my league, I called the one person who I knew had had to manage or diffuse many friends or acquaintances over the years from their overconsumption of alcohol. When I was a boy, my father was not a big drinker, but I often found it ironic that so many individuals called him late at night for help, counseling, or just a shoulder to whine on. It was always like yeah. 11 p.m., 10.30 okay? 10 p.m. on a work night, I'll be there. which, as a kid, worried me, and it kept me awake until my dad came back home, exhausted, usually around 1 to 2 a.m., and just dead tired. Sleepless nights of youth. A few times I even met my dad at the back door when he got in. Then, right there, 10-year-old me stood there. Is everything all right? What are you doing up? Is your friend all right? <laughs> yeah. He's going to be just fine. He'll be okay again. Oh, that's good. I answered, and suddenly I got tired, very tired. Hey, Paul. Alcohol is not always a good thing for some people. Keep your eye on that when you get older. Okay, son? Okay. I managed to grin, and we both called it a night. Now these events were hard on my father, I could tell, but I was really proud of him. It seemed like he could help people, and people needed his help, and they asked for it when no one else could help them. Now, I needed to get away, so so off my own schedule, I took a walk, and I wound up down at a quiet wharf at Mallory Square. I pulled out my cell phone, and I called my father. I explained my last 24 hours in Key West with Steve, and even in his late 70s, there I was seeking out my father. Not for pity, because there'd be none of that, but direction. And advice. From my cell phone, this man of very few but select words told me, Hi Paul, yeah, I was worried that Steve might be a drinker. I never realized the extent though. Do you think you could do this work without Steve? I have a lot in the line, Dad. I, I, I can do the work alone. I, I know I can. Or I can use the kids from the local college as interns after Tuesday, tomorrow, after five. I want to stay on track. I only have a week here, Dad. Uh, I need a crew. If I had weeks or months, I could pull this off. It was then that I learned my dad's secret for his art of managing high consumers of alcohol. And he told me the following. Paul, 
distract Steve. Give him responsibilities. Concentrate on work and nothing but work. Let that be your focus to him. Don't make any deals. Don't make any promises with him. Tell him that he has to get busy and do something to help himself or distract him. He's hired, he's down there to work, and he's got a family back home that's counting on him. My dad continued. Look, I know there's more going on there than I even know, but in general, for me, this approach has helped refocus many men, drinkers, some community leaders and otherwise. Dad, what if this doesn't work? <sighs> My father sighed. If Steve's an alcoholic, he may not respond to any kind of structure. You may have to send him off to do other non-existent work while you and the others, the interns, do the rest. Now the kids are eager, Dad. They want this practical experience to help work on the project. So far, that eagerness has only been through me. These kids have had production classes, they've been recommended to me by their teacher, and I get to use them after 5 o'clock tomorrow. Are you logging footage tonight? Yeah. Well, call me tomorrow, give me an update, and let me know what happens. But most of all, don't worry. Isn't that the great thing about parents? So in the past two days, we've experienced assaults, apologies, run-ins, bad pickup lines, really bad ones, and a glass tabletop getting sucked to the bottom of a swimming pool. <laughs> it's taken me almost 10 years to finally see the humor and the literal hands-on learning that took place. But after 10 years, I realized this experience has been a great two days of adventure. Just an adventure outside of my comfort zone, though. But, as they say, the most challenging was yet to come. Please listen to the conclusion of life's learning curves, tropical turpitude. Will the human spirit survive? Will it win? Huh? For Life's Learning Curve, I'm Paul Hart. See you next time. Life's Learning Curve podcast is put together by producer Paul Hart with assistance by Charles Hines, Michelle Suckery, and S.T. Dog. We're mixed by Heidi Cerner, technical director Ted McArthur. As always, music and audio assistance by Riley Hart. Visit our website, lifeslearningcurve.buzzsprout.com. Special thanks today to consultant Clay Greger. As always, don't forget to choose like on Facebook. Find us again where you're listening right now, almost everywhere where podcasts are heard. I'm Paul Hart, and we will be back soon with the conclusion of Tropical Turpitude from Life's Learning Curve.